On interpretations of space at manorial sites in Normandy in the Central Middle Ages, and what spatial analysis can provide to social meanings of buildings and sites. And this is focusing on some pilot studies that I've undertaken at manorial sites in the region of Calvados. So the sites that are under interpretation here are the Chateau de Colly, the Mont de Rochard, and the Mont d'Olive. Um, and the main focus here will be the Mont d'Olive for a chance of reinterpretation to some degree and some realignment of thinking about that society there. Uh, Cruelly and Beaumont will be studied. They're two later and similar types of manner, and they'll be studied briefly um, and, and together. So what I hope to ultimately demonstrate here is the varying applicability of spatial, spatial analysis in considering the social interpretations of buildings, particularly when you get into the interdisciplinary studies of buildings and societies. The spatial analysis, I think, obviously should be used to deepen an understanding of society and their buildings, such as those that we're going to look at today at Calvados in a period of culture exchange, domination, and altering views at authority. And I hope more so at the Mont d'Olive, I'll be able to do just that for you. Now, to start, the Chateau de Cluly, it's first mentioned in a charter of 1058, but it contains a core of buildings from around 1160, a hall and chamber complex, obviously incorporated heavily into some later buildings into the later medieval and post-medieval periods. So roughly, you've got about a core here and a core here that contains the 1160 materials. Access to the hall was via a door that's right here. You can see it on MP's reconstruction, and it's also, it's a bit dark, but that's the same door as this one right there. Now this entered into a single aisle hall on, on the quote unquote low end with an open hearth and a dais on the opposite end in the main portion of the hall. And at that end of the hall as well was a point of access leading from the high end of the, the hall into the southern room of the ground floor. Now there's no access between the ground floor and the first floor of what's interpreted as the chamber block. That would be roughly this building back here, some of that bit on that side. Um, although there was stonework from the later 12th century indicating these as being interior rooms at that point. Uh, but instead, MP, um, Edward Impey interprets the upper chambers as being located through an, what he calls an architecturally impressive staircase that was mounted into the northern end of the chamber block. And he views this as representing a ceremonial entrance to the chamber rooms. So something up in here, which no longer exists, getting up into the upper rooms up in there. Now, Boma le Richard is nearly contemporary to Cluly. It dates to circa 1150. And the remains are more or less a near, near complete chamber block alongside a contemporary or a near contemporary hall. So you can see this is the chamber block complex, and that's the hall complex, that building and that building. This is much, much newer, <coughs> as is most of the enclosure and so on over here. Um, now, these were partly ruined, perhaps, in 1944. It is still a working farm as well, so I'll point out that these pictures that I've taken here, I am trespassing indeed. I probably shouldn't have said that while we're recording, actually. Um, the site sits atop a natural limestone outcropping within the, 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 the viewpoint. It's a rise that's really distinct from the surrounding areas that you can see just from this view here. Now, the chamber block you had a ground floor um, of a single room. Whilst the first floor had space divided into two separate rooms, and the ground floor is assumed to be storage space with the living space above, this form will be very familiar to those of you who deal with the first floor hall question in England. And the hall structure, which I don't have a good plan of, I'm sorry to say, um, is embedded within a series of buildings, and it largely consists of the remains of a northern and eastern wall from which MP extracts that it's much the same, a four-way single-aisled hall. Um, and the hall coexisted with possible auxiliary buildings to the north and east. These are speculated to be your sort of typical lesser chambers, subsidiary chambers, and possibly a chapel, this building complex right here. Now, the access analysis between these two spaces are somewhat similar, although it clearly appears slightly more complicated just for having more identifiable spaces within the remaining fabric. Both have internal accesses from a single springing point, so the yard here and the courtyard here. And the areas of the interpreted halls and chambers remain separate spaces with the exception of the grounds floors at Cruley. And in both, there's a primary concern for more secluded spaces. These are spaces at a higher depth rather than more public-facing rooms as well. And this is more clear at Cruley with spaces at a higher depth kind of demonstrating this, this sort of concern for seclusion. Uh, this is something that you see very commonly in chamber blocks that are incorporated within their hall spaces when they're incorporated into single buildings. Now, none of this should come as any surprise to those of you who are more familiar with the English building culture than the Norman in the same period. So we're well within this period of the joint lordships and the cross-channel similarities here are really striking. And in fact, really, clearly in Beaumont, and uh, uh, really resemble sites such as Boothby Pagnell, Christchurch Street, Temple, Portchester Castle, and vice versa. So there's really striking similarities, obviously, between the English and Norman sides here. 
Now, spatially and socially, they bear a strong resemblance to one another, and that gives you a lot, I think, to bear in mind with, when we talk about this cross-cultural society. And unpicking some of the greater context of these places through the lordships and through the alliances, not to mention the landscape and the social interpretations, I think are the real opportunities here, something I'm going to move forward into. But I hope to do this in greater detail at the Mont Olive, which I'm going to spend the rest of my time speaking about. Now, the 11th century residence excavated within the Foyer de Grimbeau was, at the time of its build, the household of Ernest Tyson. And it was built and abandoned at the time of tension between Ernest and his brother Raoul, about 1040s to the 1050s. Now, the Tyson family in this period is in a period of instability, as, frankly, most of Normandy is as well. We're just over the minority of Duke William here. This was 1035 to 1047. And this is just after the Tyson family themselves rising to power sometime between 1017 and 1025. So the Tysons were operating in a new lordship, and this was uneasily divided between both Raoul and Ones. And the contention between these awkward divisions of land holding, as well as competing patronage, led to a certain amount of friction between the brothers. And I'll suggest a reading of Lichto 1968 for what's probably the fullest reconstruction of their joint holdings. And I'll explore the, the Tysons a bit more in a moment here. Now, the Mont d'Alevay was built by Ernest and has long been interpreted as a seigneurial residence, but this interpretation as a residence, I think, needs to be questioned, and it's a process of interrogation that can really help us define more the nature of the site. Now, the two enclosures of the site, of the north and the south of the Mont, were separated with no access between the two, and here's the plan from the excavation reports, and then a, a reconstruction. It looks a bit off-kilter because the, the picture is actually this way, and I converted it so it more matches the layout of the site there. Now, the southern enclosure was used for stables. There was a small forge there. And the northern enclosure encompassed what's been interpreted as a hall, kitchen, and chapel. So essentially, the hall, extra building, kitchen, and chapel interpreted there. There's another stone-constructed building that's said as sort of a gatehouse containing a first-floor wooden footbridge that crosses to the mott, and that's represented there. Now, the overall interpretation of this site, I think, especially on the resident side, is deeply problematic. And I'd like to address a few issues here in the time left that I have to consider these interpretations. Now, firstly, the, the interpretation of the absidal building as a chapel. Now, a part of the tensions between Raoul and Ernais included competition in monastic patronage. Raoul had founded Fontenay, this is Fontenay in Normandy, with the permission of William after Valadun in 1046. However, Ernest was more closely associated with St. Wandrill, which is later called Fontenelle. It's probably a more familiar name. And at that time, Fontenelle was already a very powerful abbey. And Ernest had attempted to bring his brother's foundation at Fontenay under the influence of Fontenelle, with the gift of a finger bone of St. Antienne from Fontenelle to Fontenay. And traditionally, this was the beginning of the association of Fontenay with St. Antienne as well. Now, Decon states that there is a tradition at Fontenay that its chapel of St. Andrew of Olivet was situated in the ruins here, speculating that it was possible that this particular building here, it's not a great picture, but that's the outsidal end seen on the plan there, um, was actually this chapel. And he states that perhaps this survived the, 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 um, the site after its, its um, abandonment in the 1050s. However, there's no charter reference, there's no citation for this at all, so obviously a bit of trawling through charters is needed here in the future. Um, however, though, a chapel at Olivet for Fontenay would have inevitably been outside of the period that we're looking at here. Fontenay was not the favored abbey of Ernais, the brother who built these structures. And so a chapel given to Fontenay would have been dedicated, I, I think, probably in the mid-12th century, when you see the Tyson family rising back into power and Fontenay becoming large again. So de is assuming a continuity to a chapel in a site that was abandoned in the 1050s. But this building here doesn't necessarily have to be a chapel in this period. Now, the site itself actually suggests, and I hate to be practical about it, but an absidal end of the structure um, could be just a very efficient use of space at the edge of the spur. The north and the east of this structure, there's a very, very steep drop, which you can kind of see indicated. It's not very clear in the picture. But that right there are the tops of trees down the slope below. So it's a very steep drop there. Additionally, obviously, the building is aligned north-south instead of the more usual east-west. Um, there's no sort of footing for an altar that was found in excavation, although it is acknowledged that actually this end of the building was cleared for artillery in 1944. So I want to suggest for the time being that this small building might have been no more than a small chamber, subchamber, storage room out, outside of the main building. 
There's nothing to suggest that it's necessarily an 11th century chapel other than its apsidal construction. But here also I'd like to suggest that Baudry de Bourgueil's um, description of Adela of Bois' bedchamber in the 1090s also gives us another example of an apsidal room that was not in, in ecclesiastic use. So perhaps we have the expectation to find a chapel at what is expected to be an aristocratic residence rather than a conclusive chapel. Now there's also some problems between the space between the residence and the gatehouse in which Decom places an undescribed building that loosely links the two structures. And the weight of this evidence appears to be um, the large paired post holes on the southern end of the hall interpreted as a, a grand doorway due to the size of the posts. And those are those two posts right there. Now the main door of the hall is interpreted on the western end of the tip though actually. So there's actually a door jam remaining right here which is interpreted as the entrance to the hall versus this quote-unquote grand entrance to here. Seen slightly better, I think. Doorway here and post holes here. Now, Decal mentions as well, and you'll have to forgive my French, um, a informé de pierre et bolet, roughly a shapeless mass of unformed stones or crumbling stones that he'd found to the south of these very large post holes, but he doesn't describe these nor were they measured or documented in any way. Um, so without proper records of these finds and without any firm phasing between these two buildings, um, we can't really say much other than the fact that they existed in two very rapid builds. So it's likely that this southern end of the hall here, this extra room here, was built probably at the same time as the gatehouse as an extension to the hall structure as well. And a separate room here on the ground floor might explain this space as well. Um, there is an alignment of these three post holes right here, which may suggest a separate ground floor room, which then would make the second entry a bit more reasonable as well. Now, Decant consistently interprets the site as a seigneurial residence with some military or watchtower purposes stating that the two functions of the site subsidiary to that of being a residence was a location to monitor the land around it and to oversee the project of deforestation that was happening in the area surrounded it. This is indicated by his pollen analysis. Now he also lists the small finds as further proof of this area as a residence. So he talks about the ceramics, weapons, spurs, lightweight horseshoes, game pieces, and a general mention of bijoux. All to Decan indicate the high social category of those who lived here, um, even if he mentions as well that the ceramics themselves are fruste, they're, they're um, rough, a bit rough. However, also there's no small finds report located within the site, nor an analysis of any animal bones, if there were any that were found and documented. Now, to me, the available evidence, combined with a spatial and a landscape analysis, suggests that the Mont d'Olive was um, not a seigneurial residence of any kind, but instead a military outpost with the primary purpose of observing the lands around it. It has a physical location at the top of a tall spur surrounded on two sides by creeks and a clear view of the land around it. And this firstly suggests an ideal watchtower position. And its reuse, I think, for artillery in 1944 still confirms its strategic location within the modern landscape as well. The small finds briefly touched upon by de seem focused on the muscular trappings of military men. So even the bijou, if not specified, I think could, could be any number of personal ornamentation. The residence itself has been interpreted as a hall and aula, and this is not necessarily untrue without a suitable examination of the construction phases and without available documentation such as the areas of the unformed stones and so forth. The explanation of a hall with post holes and posts supporting an upper room, a chapel, kitchen, and gatehouse sit really uncomfortable with an examination of the site in its spatial and landscape context. The mod itself covers very little ground. This is the entire space that is up on the top of the mod as well. Um, and there's very little evidence of, of occupation on this site, and it couldn't have spatially held a, a, a good number of people to say nothing of the tower on top of it. Now, the site was not only in occupation for a short time, and that in that tension period between Ernais and Raoul Tassin, upon whose borders the forest and the mod itself was located. The forest clearing that was happening in tandem with the occupation of the site could have been a part of the forest management and a fledgling agricultural industry, but could have equally been a way to have clearing the sight lines for the um, surrounding view of the valley floors, the access routes, the lines of communication, and the surrounding lower lying land. Fito as well as Decan note this topographical location, with Fito giving it much more late weight, particularly with its overlook between um, the Mont, which is right here, and the main road into Mont Voisy, which is right here. Um, but Fito also refers to it as a chateau as well. So with the counter arguments that I've presented here, um, I'd like to perhaps think that this is time to consider this a prime location for a lookout between two battling brothers that also gave the site its prime location and was not intended permanently as a residence. 
Ernest Tyson's kaput, it's worth mentioning, is only 11 kilometers here in Choi Harcourt. So that's Choi Harcourt and Glimbo and the Mont right there. The Mont d'Olivet is dated to being in existence only for a couple of decades in the 1040s and 50s. Before its abandonment, it was directly on the border between Montrossi, the territory of Raoul, and Grimbo, the territory of Ernès, this line right here. The Mont was constructed in a strong spur of the landscape, overlooking the boundary, following the Reçu du Coupe Georges, which is essentially the cutthroat creek, which I love, that separated Montrossi from Grimbo. What's lost in the reports one paragraph. What's lost in the reports in, in reconstruction from the document is that when viewed on site, this is indeed the highest point in the landscape. It overlooks Montrossi directly to the east, as well as without the tall trees currently there, a straight line of sight to the north in the flatter lands below the Orne. It's difficult to access and it is isolated. So access analysis hasn't previously been used to talk about function, but I think here it gives a certain indication, um, just sort of moving very quickly through this, but you can see a certain amount of, of, of implications for the seclusion here. This is all the locations of the Mott. And unlike other places, this has an astonishing height of seven, so there's an extreme idea of what, you know, the isolation essentially. And this is privacy, it's not prestige, as this tower, but simply, I think, security. So based on the space and the landscape, I think this was no more than a boundary outpost. But this is not necessarily a grand, far-fetched reinterpretation, but in understanding this building and its place demonstrates the importance to those who are in these buildings. We've been approaching this place from the wrong footing to begin with. Um, instead of reading bijou as trinkets of a well-off set of knights, gaming pieces and so forth might be more easily seen as belongings of a very bored set of men killing time when not standing their watch. Instead of trying to read aristocratic occupation in a site that's hardly a chateau, we can read something of a retinue less taking place in an aristocratic display in a main estate, but really living the boring bits of an everyday life of a knight in the 11th century. This, I think, is the direction that we need to go to when we start to face the Mont d'Olivet and indeed, I think, all medieval buildings, putting them into the wider context of their space and place. Thank you.